If you've been in any socialist spaces online over the past couple of months, you've more than likely encountered self-proclaimed communists who vocally support Russia in the recent conflict with Ukraine. According to these people, Russia is engaged in anti-imperialist activity by attacking Ukraine, who were puppets of NATO and its leading Western imperialist powers. And if you're lucky enough to not live in a terminally online pseudo-communist echo chamber, this probably sounds batshit insane to you. And that's because it is. At least mostly. Communists adhere to historical materialism, which sees class struggle as the driving force of history. But these people are abandoning the fight of class against class and putting in its place the fight of country against country. And most bizarrely of all, Russia by its own admission is not a socialist country led by and for the working class. It's an openly capitalist dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. So it can't even be said that supporting this country's actions is supporting the struggle of some stronghold of the working class, which some might have tried to argue while the Soviet Union existed. Instead, what we're seeing here is blatantly just cheerleading for one capitalist power against another. The suffering working classes of each country dying in this war be damned. So what's going on here? Why have these supposed communists completely abandoned class struggle in favour of picking teams to support in capitalist wars? Well, simply put, this is the result of campism. What the holy feck is campism, you may ask? Well today my friends, we're gonna take a look at this and why it's so unbelievably f <clears throat> let's say, uh, misguided. But first, if you're new here, then go ahead and hit subscribe and turn on the notification bell below for Marxist educational content and analysis. Speaking of the conflict in Ukraine, prices of just about everything here in Ireland are currently skyrocketing as a result. And, well, to be honest with you, times are rough at the moment. So if you're in a position to do so, then please consider tossing a euro or a dollar per month over on Patreon to help keep my head above water. If you're not in a position to support financially, you can also help out by sharing this video around on social media. Now, according to campism, the world is divided up into two camps. On the one hand, you've got the imperialist United States and its allies like Germany, France, Japan, etc. And on the other hand, you've got the anti-imperialist camp of those who challenge US imperialism in some way, including Russia, China, Iran, Syria, etc. According to this view, we live in essentially a unipolar world wherein the United States is the sole hegemon which leads an imperialist bloc of other lesser imperialist powers and comprador states which exist alongside one another in a relatively unified, peaceful coexistence. All countries within this camp loosely share in a common neoliberal imperialist economic agenda. In contrast to this, according to the campus worldview, is an anti-imperialist bloc of countries who oppose the current order. This is headed by Russia and China, but also includes countries like Cuba, the DPRK, Vietnam, Laos, Syria, Iran, Belarus and others. Now, the origins of this worldview go back to the aftermath of the Second World War when the Soviet Union defeated the Nazis and the new Eastern Bloc of socialist-oriented countries was established. In the coming years and decades, numerous countries across Asia, Africa and Latin America declared themselves to be socialists. This created the concept of a capitalist camp and a socialist camp, the West and the East, as well as a further non-aligned camp, though this often tended to lean towards the socialist camp. The declaration of these proletarian states meant that class struggle itself could now in some cases be viewed at the level of proletarian states against capitalist states. This was argued to be an expression of class struggle on the international stage, fighting for the defeat of the capitalist imperialist system at the global scale, which would open up the pathway for all of these socialist oriented countries to progress towards actual communism. But unfortunately, this socialist camp was defeated, not from without, but from within, by revisionists who mounted successful counter-revolutions for the restoration of capitalism. This is generally exemplified by the collapse of the Eastern Bloc in 1989 and the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, though in truth the process of capitalist restoration had begun long before that. These moments were simply the final nails in the coffin. And yet, despite capitalist restoration occurring across the former socialist bloc, some still mechanically view the world in terms of these two opposing camps, as though we're all still living in the 1960s and nothing's fundamentally changed. Let's turn now to look at why this is such a deeply, eh, uh, misguided view of the world for socialists today. While there certainly is truth in the argument that the world is currently headed by US imperialism, this is also a massive oversimplification that ignores inter-imperialist contradictions within this camp itself. 
For example, France's opposition to the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq shows that this definitely isn't some perfectly unified Western imperialist bloc. But the campists' naive oversimplification of politics at the global scale conflates opposition to certain activities of Western imperialists with anti-imperialism itself. As though no other countries in the world are also engaged in similar capitalist imperialist mechanisms, even if on a significantly smaller scale. It shouldn't even need to be said, but anti-imperialism is not simply opposition to whatever the US and its loose allies are engaged in. Anti-imperialism is opposition to capitalism itself and its highest stage wherever it may rear its head, whether in the West or in the East. And following on from that, modern Russia absolutely is a capitalist imperialist power in accordance with Lenin's criteria outlined in imperialism the highest stage of capitalism. So let's briefly go through these five characteristics one by one and how they apply to modern Russia. 1. State capitalist monopolies play a decisive role in Russia's economic life, to the point where Russia's own federal anti-monopoly service stated in 2018 that the state's share in the Russian economy via monopolistic state-owned enterprises was between 60 and 70 percent. 2. Russia's native industrial and banking capital have each monopolized and merged together, and indeed with the state itself, to form Russian finance capital and a financial oligarchy who wields this finance capital. For example, the fourth largest firm in all of Russia is the state-owned banking and financial services provider known as Sparebank. At the head of this firm is a man named Hermann Greff, a politician, businessman and the CEO and chairman of the executive board of Sparebank who's held various positions in the Russian government over the course of his lifetime. Hermann Greff is the quintessential example of what Lenin described as a financial oligarch who demonstrates how industrial capital, banking capital and the Russian government and state themselves have all merged into one force for the growth and expansion of finance capital. And there are numerous others like him too. 3. The export of capital, rather than just the export of commodities, has grown to the level of exceptional importance in Russia as, and this is crucial, Russia is a net exporter of capital rather than a net importer, with a net international investment position, or IIP, of over 487 billion US dollars as of 2019. 4. Russia participates in various international monopolist capitalist associations, including being a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. More importantly, however, is the development of the more independent International Capitalist Association of BRICS, comprised of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Though within this developing association, it should be stated that only Russia and China, themselves being net capital exporters, so far have achieved the status of being imperialist powers in their own right. And lastly, 5. Russia participates in the territorial division of the world, as we can explicitly see in Ukraine at the moment. Now, critics might point to independence referendums in the Donbass region in Crimea, but this doesn't negate the reality of Russian state forces moving into these territories to secure this redivision of the world by military force. Whether you consider this positive or negative morally is beside the point. It's still Russia concretely participating in the territorial division and redivision of the world. We also need to consider hidden territorial division through neo-colonialism and the carving up of spheres of influence in the world, which is much more popular today among the imperialist powers than the open brute force approach. For example, Russia maintaining Syria within its sphere of influence so as to secure access to not only key natural resources like oil, natural gas and phosphate, but also Russia's naval facility in the Syrian city of Tardis, which gives Russia a military foothold in the region from which it can conduct activities further afield. So as we can see, Russia meets all five of Lenin's criteria for a capitalist imperialist country. But with that being said, it can't be understated that the Western imperialist powers, and yes, particularly the USA, are engaged in each of these five criteria to a far, far greater degree. It's not much of an exaggeration to claim that Russian imperialism is a mere molehill next to the colossal Everest that is US imperialism. But all the same, both are qualitatively capitalist imperialist powers and supporting a lesser imperialist power against a greater imperialist power is simply lesser evilism. Despite what the campists would have you believe, this lesser evilism is not anti-imperialism but simply a crude and overly simplistic anti-western imperialism. For some reason, eastern imperialism, such as that of the Russian Federation, is A-OK -okay according to these campists. Now it should be acknowledged that the principal contradiction or main conflict in the world today is that between imperialism and the oppressed nations. 
And with this in mind, it's reasonable to critically support oppressed nations like Cuba, Vietnam, the DPRK, etc. on this basis against imperialism. But Russia, as demonstrated earlier, isn't an oppressed nation, but a capitalist imperialist power in its own right. Therefore, there's no basis for communists to support it along these lines, even critically. There's nothing anti-imperialist about supporting an imperialist power. And this leads us to another common misconception that's espoused by these campists. The myth that there are countries that are capitalist and are planning on remaining capitalist, but also somehow anti-imperialist. When we understand imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism as Marxists do, it's clear that only an anti-capitalist country can be an anti-imperialist country. This would preferably be historically progressive, moving forward with the dictatorship of the proletariat and transitioning from the capitalist mode of production towards the industrial communist mode of production, or it could be historically regressive, seeking to revert to the feudal mode of production. A country that's not seeking to move forward to socialism, nor backwards to feudalism, but instead simply seeking to carve out a better position for itself within the global capitalist order, getting a bigger slice of that yummy capitalist pie, is not an anti-imperialist country in any way whatsoever. Even the primarily oppressed nations that aren't imperialist themselves but are remaining on the capitalist road can't be accurately described as anti-imperialist by anyone who adheres to the Marxist understanding of imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism. This is important because there are some who would describe Syria, Iran, Belarus, etc. as being supposedly anti-imperialist countries, despite the fact that each of these countries is simply seeking a better position for itself within the global capitalist system, rather than actually opposing imperialism by progressing towards socialism or indeed regressing to feudalism. As socialists, we don't stand with imperialist powers and their comprador lackeys. We stand with the working class and oppressed masses of the world, including those in both Russia and Ukraine. Our war is not that of one capitalist country against another, in which the international working class has nothing to gain and everything to lose, including life itself. Our war is the class war against the capitalists, the imperialists and their comprador lackeys whether from the west or from the east towards the establishment of socialism internationally. Not country against country, but class against class. Right, thanks very much for watching this video, hopefully you found it useful in one way or another. Thank you to PLK who I did a stream with on this very topic over on the Paul Connolly channel which sparked a lot of the thinking behind this video. Apologies for the delays and uploads, I'm working on a long form video on the Irish Republican movement and the 850 year history of anti-colonial resistance, so that's been taking up most of my time and I probably won't realistically be ready for another couple of months. But I'll try my best in any ways to release a few more shorter videos like this one in the meantime, maybe squeezing in a few Socialism 101 videos in the process. Thanks as always to the supporters on Patreon who continue to make this possible. Thank you Julia Affentranger, Ian McShay, Hugh Gopnik, Ian Snyder, Jacob Jaff, Borku Gorilla, Ryan Hodgson, Soup, Madeline, Sonic232, Sagan, Michaela Schmidt, Christian Nepales, Alfonso Dingo Torres, Mekalova, Rock Artist, Todd Sprang, Nike the Sades, Sakasi, Anglo-Irish Bolshevik, Amy Schmidt, Eli Leslie, Thomas Ross and Wood, Bobby Block, Jason Schmidt, Del Siebold, Train Age 13, Mitch Schiller, Saoirse Nivelen, Roja, MLM and Practice, Brian Rules, Eric Lindahl, ZK Goody, Coil Rap, Robert Jarzak, Ayob Farah, Becky, Pastor Schubert, Mr. Miyamoto, Coil King, Reverend Lonnome Hollywood, Wonderbad, JT Chapman, Joseph Shepard, Jack Schneidman, Comrade Amara, Wealth for the 99%, and Spoop. Cheers everyone, Augustlongafowl.